Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Doherty. I am a professor of political science here at Beloit College. I would like to thank you all for coming to today's Lunchbox talk, which is about uh, the effectiveness of the use of drones as part of US counterterrorism policy. I'm going to offer some observations about the central claims that the United States government is making about its use of drones for a targeted killing campaign. I will not, however, because I don't have enough time, will be discussing, I will not discuss the, the legal claims that the United States advances that buttress the use of drones. And that claim is that the United States is at a state of war with Al Qaeda, that it has the right to self-defense based on the 9-11 attacks, and that because it is at war, it can legally conduct a campaign of targeted killing. I will note, however, that this American position is severely contested by legal scholars um, and many other um, observers of this, some of whom have referred to this as, quote, a novel and aggressive interpretation, unquote, of international humanitarian law. Prior to 9-11, the United States itself rejected the legality of targeted killing campaigns, notably one that the Israelis were carrying out against the Palestinians. Just a few basic um, kind of background pieces of information about the US drone program. The United States has had surveillance drones for a long time. And in the late 1990s, um, as the Clinton administration was attempting to figure out how to deal with the rising threat of Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda, um, neither the CIA nor the Air Force were willing to take responsibility um, for an, uh, to supervise a, uh, a program of armed drones. All right. The CIA said that um, it you know, was an intelligence agency and that didn't do military things, and the Air Force said um, that it didn't do surveillance. So neither of them wanted to have an armed drone program. Within two weeks of the 9-11 attacks, however, the George W. Bush administration had issued um, very broad-ranging executive authority to the Central Intelligence Agency to carry out the global war on terror. Um, and that included the decision to arm the Predator drone. So the um, existence of an armed drone program actually is a direct outcome of the 9-11 attacks. I would also note at this point that in and of themselves, drones are not illegal weapons. It, under the right circumstances, the use of drones is, in fact, legal under international humanitarian law. The U.S. actually has two separate drone programs. One is being carried out by the Central Intelligence Agency and is not publicly acknowledged by the United States to even exist. The second one is carried out by the military, by the Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC. Um, JSOC is a highly secretive organization. Um, its leadership almost never, um, for example, gives press interviews, and the JSOC campaign is shrouded in secrecy, just as the one um, by the CIA. But the US at least admits that JSOC is actually carrying out drone strikes. The CIA and JSOC actually have two separate kill lists. It is unclear the degree to which the two organizations are actually coordinating who is on those lists. It's unclear how they decide who gets to be on those lists. It's unclear when they decide to take somebody's name off of those kill lists. The CIA uh, is civilian drone operators. The military obviously are military um, officers who are undertaking this. And this has led to um, a, a degree of tension between um, the CIA and the military. Um, the military believes that the job of, of killing in war actually belongs to it. Um, there are some in the CIA who are also concerned about the fact that the CIA's traditional mission has been to gather intelligence not to be a paramilitary organization, and that the drone program is actually pushing the CIA away from being effective at its core mission of gathering intelligence. The Obama administration um, over the last year has publicly stated that it wanted to shift the drone program away from the control of the CIA and turn it all over to JSOC, to the military, at least partially, partially in response to um, criticisms about the, the tremendous amount of secrecy that surrounds the CIA portion of the program. However, um, there were reports in the Washington Post just within the last couple of days um, that there is a provision in the new appropriations bill um, which will stymie these efforts, um, in which some of the congressional um, committees want to ensure that the funding is not provided that would allow for this shift. So within Congress, apparently the intelligence committees want the CIA to maintain control over a drone program, while the um, Armed Services Committee in both the House and the Senate want JSOC to have control over that. So there are some domestic political issues going around here. Um, 
I would also mention that um, many people were outraged that this report was even linked because of the fact that the, um, this particular part of the appropriations bill was in a secret annex, which never should have been made public to begin with. The United States has carried out drone strikes in Iraq and Afghanistan, both of which, of course, have been acknowledged American battlefields, but also in places where the United States is not officially at war, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Yemen is especially problematic um, in this regard, or rather Somalia is especially problematic in this regard, um, because in the other places at least, the United States is striking at affiliates of Al-Qaeda. So in Yemen, it's Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. In Somalia, what the United States is striking at are members of Al-Shabaab, which is a separate organization based in Somalia that may have links to Al-Qaeda. Right? And so that you know, begins to raise all kinds of, um, of legal issues. Most drone strikes, of course, have been targeted at non-Americans, but there have been several occasions in which American citizens have been deliberately targeted and killed by a drone strike. And there have also been several instances in which American citizens have been bystanders who have been killed by drone strikes targeted at other people. The Obama administration has dramatically escalated um, the number of strikes by drones um, over that of the George W. Bush administration. Right? This really is, is not a, a kind of a partisan issue uh, in the sense that both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have used almost identical legal and practical arguments to bolster their use of drone programs. Um, both of them have enforced secrecy and both of them have been willing to use them um, both in acknowledged and unacknowledged um, battlefields. Both the Bush and the Obama administrations have made the argument um, um, about the use of drones that it is the single most important counterterrorism tool that the United States possesses. They say it's effective, it's precise, and that it is better than the alternatives, one of which, of course, would be um, to have American boots on the ground in these areas. According to um, proponents of the drone programs, the precision nature of their strikes and the nature of the technology have a number of benefits. First of all, that it kills terrorists, especially high-value targets. Um, secondly, that it minimizes civilian casualties. Thirdly, it reduces the need for U.S. boots on the ground. And fourthly, as a result, minimizes American casualties in the effort to um, combat global terrorism. Drone technology allows the United States to surveil and track its suspects for an extended period of time in remote areas um, where the United States and its allies, such as the Pakistani or the Yemeni government, um, are not going to have a presence. Right? I mean, one of the reasons why the um, organizations are in these areas is precisely because they're remote and outside of the um, governance of the uh, state authorities. Drone strikes greatly reduce the amount of time, um, the gap between identifying a target right, and then deploying lethal force against it. This has consistently been a major problem for the United States in counterterrorism efforts. The Clinton administration, for the example, in the late 1990s, had several opportunities um, to strike at um, Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. And in all of those cases, not only were there concerns about the potential for civilian casualties, but also whether or not he was still going to be there by the time the legal authority, et cetera, had moved through channels in Washington. You don't have that issue with drone strikes because you've been following the individuals um, over an extended period of time. Um, thanks to the precise nature of drone strikes and these kinds of technological advantages, United States claims that only a handful, a handful of civilians have been killed in drone strikes since the United States began its program of targeted killing in 2004. We note that it is, in fact, clear that drone strikes have killed large numbers of high-value target terrorists, including the leaders of the um, Afghan Taliban, the leader of the Af or the Pakistani Taliban, which actually just happened um, quite recently, and over and over and over again, taking out the number three person in the Al Qaeda hierarchy. Um, and the joke in counterterrorism circles is sort of like the most dangerous position in Al Qaeda is to be elevated to the number three position, right? Because they have so consistently been able to take this person out. However, I think we need to ask the question whether or not killing large numbers of terrorists, and again, by saying that, accepting the administration's argument that the people who are being targeted are, in fact, terrorists, all right? But we should ask, if, in fact, we are killing large numbers of terrorists um, through a targeted killing campaign, is this an unalloyed benefit? Right? 
um, which is the position that is seemingly assumed by the proponents of, of, of targeted killing via drone strikes. The argument that is offered by proponents here um, is that drone strikes degrade the capabilities of terrorist organizations. They remove highly skilled people, such as bomb makers, for example, who are not easily replaced, even if recruitment goes up, right? and this will make future attacks less effective. People um, who are focused on avoiding drones, of course, um, are forced into secrecy and evasive actions, and this will um, disrupt planning, communications, training, and the actual carrying out of terrorist attacks. So the, you know, the argument is you take out high-value targets, you degrade the ability of a terrorist organization to actually carry out future strikes. However, there actually is good um, scholarly evidence based on looking at um, campaigns like this in other, er you know, in other parts of the world um, you know, over the past several decades that suggests that decapitation, i.e. taking out high value targets, going after the leadership of the organization and killing them, all right, that decapitation as a counterterrorism strategy is most effective against a centralized opponent, i.e. a group that is very hierarchical and has strong leadership. Al-Qaeda and its franchises, of course, are the exact opposite. They are highly decentralized. The local franchises have a great deal of autonomy. When the United States, for example, killed um, the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, not in a drone strike, but in a regular bombing campaign, it did not in any way reduce the ability of Al-Qaeda co to continue to carry out deadly strikes in Iraq. It was simply too decentralized. Not only that, Al-Qaeda in Iraq's um, connection back to Al-Qaeda Central and to Osama bin Laden was actually fairly tenuous. Um, Al-Qaeda Central was telling Al-Qaeda in Iraq to stop killing Shia civilians in Iraq. And the local affiliate said, sorry, we're trying to you know, get a sectarian war going here. We're going to continue to kill Shia civilians, which is exactly what they did. All right? So you know, this is a, a tactic that can be successful, but not necessarily against the kind of opponent that the United States is actually facing in Al-Qaeda. Not only that, decapitation strikes can have very adverse effects. Greater secrecy and more radical decentralization of an organization can actually make it harder for counterterrorism um, uh, forces to actually find and track individuals within a particular organization. You can radicalize the movement. This is exactly what happened um, with the Israeli targeted killing campaign. It went after a lot of um, Yasser Arafat's opponents. What you ended up being left with was Yasser Arafat and radical Islamist leaders in Hamas. Right? They remove the people who would actually have been willing to take um, a less violent stance towards, um, towards Israel. And we've seen this. The, the leader of the Pakistani, Pakistani Taliban who replaced the one who was recently killed in a US drone strike is actually far worse than the person that he actually replaced. It is clear um, from what is going on in Pakistan and Yemen that actually these kinds of strikes are spurring recruitment. Although again, it will be said, just because you are recruiting large numbers of people doesn't mean those people will actually be able to become effective terrorists. Right? You actually need to have some skill set um, to be able to do something like um, build bombs, for example. Right? You can turn the person who has been um, targeted into a martyr. The United States you know, um, took out the leader of the Pakistani Taliban, who was widely hated in Pakistan, except the fact that it was the United States that did it via a drone strike meant there was enormous backlash against the United States, despite the fact that people in Pakistan detested the leader of the Pakistani Taliban. And finally, decapitation strikes and drone strikes in general um, have clearly been increasing anti-American sentiment. You also have to ask whether or not the United States is, in fact, as it claims, killing mainly high-value targets. Again, there's good evidence that suggests that the bulk of strikes are against lower-level operatives. And if that is the case, you again have to question whether or not attrition, i.e. killing more terrorists than the terrorist organizations can replace, whether that is likely to succeed. Right? The US experience in Vietnam tells us that attrition campaigns actually historically have very low chances of success. Another critical piece of this, though, has to do with whether or not the strikes are actually killing terrorists, all right, or whether they're killing civilians. 
And the problem here is that it is very difficult to evaluate the claims about the identity of people who are being killed in drone strikes. First of all, most of these drone strikes are taking place in very remote areas, such as the federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan or out um, in the hinterlands in Yemen. There are virtually no outside observers who are there. Journalists, human rights activists, etc., are kept out of these areas. And in Pakistan in particular, there are a lot of restrictions on the ability of um, third parties to go into areas to look at drone strikes. Um, because the individuals being killed are Muslims, they need to be buried within 24 hours of their death. That makes it a lot harder to identify who people are because by the time someone actually does get to the scene, the individuals who were killed have probably already been, um, been buried. And lastly, all sides, the United States, Pakistan, Yemen, the other state governments, and the terrorist organizations themselves, all have incentives to manipulate the number of people being killed, whether they're civilians or terrorists, depending on the situation that they're, that they're in. Right? Um, the United States does not publicly acknowledge most of its drone strikes. It does not make public the number of people who have been killed, and it does not acknowledge when civilians have actually um, been killed. It almost never admits that it is investigating a drone strike um, because it has killed civilian. A uh, very recent um, ex uh, Exception to this is that um, the December 12, 2013 drone strike in Yemen, which apparently killed 12 individuals who were part of a wedding party. That is clearly under investigation in the United States um, by the Obama administration. Right? The other thing is the United States defines unidentified men who are killed in drone strikes in the general vicinity of what happened as militants. All right? The presumption should be that if you cannot identify this person, they should be considered a civilian, not a combatant. But the United States does it the other way around. So does Pakistan. All right? Recent studies that have been done by the United Nations um, and by uh, human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, as well as by um, sort of watchdogs like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and the Long War Journal, have all um, given ranges of civilians um, that acknowledge a much higher number of people are being killed by drone strikes, civilians, than the United States um, is willing to admit to, because the United States actually says, almost no civilians are killed in drone strikes. Um, just to give you um, an example, and again, we don't have the real numbers about any of this because of the enormous um, secrecy that, surprised, that surrounds these campaigns. There was a leaked Pakistani document that came to light um, uh, last year in which the Pakistani government estimated there had been about 330 drone strikes carried out in Pakistan since 2004, that approximately 2,200 people had been killed in these strikes, and that of them, 400 were definitely civilians, and another 200, leading to a total of uh, 600, were probably civilians. Okay, 400 dead is a far cry from only a handful or single digits, which is what the United States has been claiming. Um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism um, estimates there, there have been 381 strikes in Pakistan um, and that anywhere between 416 and 951 civilians have been killed. Um, there are recent reports um, that don't look at the universe of strikes but look at um, a sort of small subset of those strikes in Yemen and in Pakistan. Um, both of these reports, one by Amnesty, one by Human Rights Watch, came out in October of um, 2013. U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham, by the way, has estimated that uh, U.S. strikes have killed, uh, U.S. drone strikes have killed 4,700 people as of early 2013. Right? Again, the, the United States generally um, refuses to acknowledge its drone strikes. It will not confirm the number of strikes. It will not confirm the number of casualties. All right? The kill lists that it operates are not subject to judicial review. JSOC raids don't even have to be um, uh, uh, reported to Congress. Right? All of this greatly inhibits informed public debate because the entire program um, is shrouded in secrecy. It very well may be that drone strikes kill large numbers of high value targets um, and kill very few civilians, but actually we really don't know that um, uh, for a fact. Right? 
And finally, I would just note that a recent United Nations report has expressed concern that the proliferation of, of armed drones may, quote, lower social barriers against the deployment of lethal force and result in attempts to weaken the relevant legal standards, right? We must be cognizant of the fact that the rules the United States is setting down right now are going to be the rules that are going to govern drone use by countries like Russia and China in the future. And both of them are within several years of having the capacity to have armed drones. I believe that we need to have a robust and informed public debate in the United States about the use of drones for targeted killing, but that requires appropriate transparency. It, it requires a discussion of whether or not we are comfortable with the tremendous expansion of executive authority in the so-called war on terror, which underlies the fact that there is so little transparency on this. Right? Drone technology actually does allow the United States to hit a particular room, right, or a particular vehicle in a remote area of Pakistan or in Yemen or in Somalia. But just because the United States can do this does not mean that it actually should engage in a widespread, targeted, a widespread program of targeted killing. And thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Are targeted killings of American civilians subject to judicial review? No. Yeah, I mean, the Obama administration has, has um, they said that they had the, um, you know, that they spent a great deal of time, that they very carefully thought about it, that their lawyers went over it, and that um, in these particular cases that American citizens um, did not have you know, that they were legitimate targets. But um, even people who believe in targeted killing um, are fairly uncomfortable with the idea that American citizens um, can be killed by a drone strike without any sort of recourse to, to the courts. Yeah. Uh, obviously, bearing in mind all of the problems you've raised, uh, is there any sort of accepted consensus on whether or not the benefits of drones like, ensure, like make them viable? Like, is there a consensus on whether or not drones are something that should be continued, or is it generally said that there's other alternatives that should be pursued? Well, I think that, that, that that's really the question. I mean, it is clear um, that if what you're trying to do is take out high-value terrorist leaders, that drone strikes are, in fact, your best bet. All right, for, for all kinds of reasons, it, it, if for no other reason than simply that the remote areas in which these people operate, it would be very difficult to, for example, capture them. Right? Um, and if you were going to capture them, it would require having US boots on the ground. It's very clear, Americans are not interested in having additional boots on the ground anywhere. Right? People want US troops to come home from Afghanistan. Um, and so in, in that respect, it, it is a useful and effective tool. Um, I think that where the, the, uh, we have gone wrong is that we haven't had a debate about whether or not this should be the only tool in the counterterrorism toolkit, um, and whether or not the number of drone strikes and the particular targets that the United States is going after may in fact be counterproductive. But again, the real problem with all of this is there is no good way to know. So like if you go onto the internet and you want to find out, you know, okay, so how many civilians have actually been killed in drone strikes? Well, you're not going to be able to find out how many drone strikes there have been, where they've been, who's been killed, et cetera. There's virtually um, no information that is provided either by the Bush administration when it was doing this and now by the Obama administration. Um, their basic argument is um, trust us. Right? We're very careful, we take this very seriously, we subject it to um, all kinds of legal scrutiny, and you can trust us on that. I'm just not sure that that is the, the best way of having a public debate about something as important as a targeted killing program. You pointed out that other countries are going to be entering this uh, regime fairly quickly, and you're talking primarily about the discussion that need, needs to happen in the United States. Could you sketch out a, an international mechanism that might work? Is there something analogous to chemical weapons treaties that might ultimately have some sway here? 
Well, there's an, a whole body of international humanitarian law, like the laws and rules of war. Um, and these are the legal arguments that, that would surround um, the use of drones. Um, and certainly those kinds of discussions have been had by uh, legal scholars in particular, but also the United Nations, for example, it has um, a special rapporteur um, on extrajudicial killing um, who has just released um, what I think is a, a very well-considered report. He never says, uses the United States by name. I mean, the whole thing is just sort of like in the abstract, using drones, here's the legal framework for this. Um, and one of the points that, um, that he makes is that um, the rules that the United States are setting are the rules that are going to apply for everyone else who uses drones after us. And that the arguments the United States is using actually are subverting some of the most um, important guarantees under the already established laws and rules of war. So there can be this kind of international level debate um, that can go on in scholarly circles that can take place in the United Nations. Um, it would be very beneficial, I think, to having a, a more global debate about the use of drones if, in fact, the United States was more forthcoming about it. But again, everyone is sort of having this conversation in the dark. I'm going to wait, wait for the microphone. Thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm Leon. And um, what other countries uh, have developed uh, so-called effective drones? Do you mean armed drones or just drone technology in general, like for surveillance? Uh, I guess I'd like to see answers to both of those questions. Okay. Um, actually, uh, drone technology for surveillance is, is um, um, becoming fairly widespread. Um, the United States is actually providing um, surveillance drones to some of its allies in the Middle East, for example. Um, it's clear that this will eventually become a, a big potential export market, right? I mean, the fact that Amazon has come out and said, we're thinking of using drones to deliver your packages to you, there are all kinds of ways in which drone technology um, can be used uh, for peaceful purposes that a lot of, uh, and, and for surveillance purposes, drones are, are tremendous. And other states actually are trying to develop that. Um, the next step beyond that then is whether or not um, states are going to arm them. And uh, it seems clear that both Russia and China um, are attempting to come up with the kind of technology that would allow them to arm a surveillance drone. There have been some reports that the Iranians um, are interested in getting this kind of technology. But certainly, you know, once the United States um, has it, or, you know, actually, with any kind of weapon, once it is shown to be effective, other states are going to want to get it. Uh, and sort of like the U.S. had a short monopoly on the atomic bomb before, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, et cetera, exploded theirs, we've got a short monopoly right now on armed drones, but it is not going to last. But when other states get those drones, and the estimates are this is you know, only a few years in the future, um, the rules they are going to want to follow are the rules that the United States is actually setting out right now. Um, and I think you, know, you can all see how you know, the United States might be pretty uncomfortable with the idea that the Chinese or Russian government could say, um, these people are our opponents, they are terrorists, and therefore we have the right to kill them outside of our own territory. So, you know, if the, the, um, the Chinese decided to go after leaders of the Tibetan independence movement outside of, of China, they consider um, the Tibetan independence movement to be illegitimate. It's a security threat to the state. They could use the same logic that the United States has used to justify that, that sort of thing. Um, and we already know the Russians, for example, have undertaken extrajudicial executions in Europe of regime opponents. Well, they might be able to, at some point, use drones to be able to do that. Um, and again, I, I don't think that the United States was, is going to be particularly happy um, if something like that happens. But we need, I mean, we need to be aware of the fact that the rules we're setting apply to everybody else. Isn't that really part of the problem? We don't know what these words mean that we're using. Terrorists. Any man's terrorist is somebody else's friend. 
um, drones. Uh, uh, I belong to Veterans for Peace, and every single weekend we take out a one-fifth scale model Reaper drone that we put on display for education purposes. We find that most people haven't got a clue as to what the United States government is actually doing in their name. They come up with the word terrorist all the time. Nobody knows what it means. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, um, I mean, there are a, a, a lot of issues um, surrounding the use of, of the word terrorist, because when you really get down to it, if you try to define um, what a terrorist is, you know, most people can agree that um, your targets have to be civilians, right? Um, that it's the use of violence for political ends, um, that you're trying to intimidate a larger population. Um, but not everybody agrees it can only be civilians who are targeted. Um, the question of whether or not states can actually carry out terrorism or only non-state actors can do it um, is very difficult. And then, you know, we have put terrorists into a different moral universe than the rest of us. You say someone is a terrorist, right? And then that means they have no rights under international human rights law. They have no rights under international humanitarian law. And you can send them to Guantanamo Bay, right? You can render them from, from other countries. Um, calling someone a terrorist is one of the most effective ways for another country to gain American support for their efforts to suppress their own opponents. And we've seen this in a number of places where the government scream terrorists and then everyone says, oh, well, whatever you need to do to, you know, to take care of that. Um, I, I think that Americans are, are very, very frightened of terrorism in a way that completely um, overestimates the actual threat to any of our lives. All right? More people die in the United States every year by being hit by large pieces of furniture in their own homes than die in terrorist attacks. Right? Um, and, and yet, we're willing to do virtually anything to try to protect ourselves um, from those attacks. And then one other thing that I would just mention, you mentioned your uh, you know, um, veterans for peace. The nature of war is a very kind of bizarre thing, right? Because it's, um, it's reciprocal killing. The whole purpose of war is to kill other people. And we accept the idea that in war, people die. But it is reciprocal. Our soldiers put their lives on the line. And the other side's soldiers put their lives on the line. You lose that in drone killing. Because drone operators, particularly the CIA ones, are sitting in office cubicles in Langley you know, by remote control um, using these drones. I'm not suggesting they think it's a video game. I mean, they, they understand very clearly they're killing real people. They can actually see their targets, right, in a way that aerial bombings can't. Um, you know, there are uh, reports that there's a lot of PTSD amongst drone operators, particularly civilians. But are we fundamentally undermining our understanding of the lethality of war if only one side is putting their lives on the line. And if we remove that, if we remove the possibility that Americans could get killed when we use lethal force, does that mean we would be more willing to use lethal force? Right? You know, under international humanitarian law, um, American soldiers are not permitted to try to protect themselves by putting other people's civilians at risk. But that is precisely what the, um, the drone campaign is, is doing. Um, I mean, on one hand, I think we all need to accept the fact, look, civilians die in war. And just because civilians die in war, that doesn't necessarily make it a war crime. Um, but we do need to have a discussion about how many civilians are we willing to sacrifice Right, without any commensurate sacrifice on, on, our, on our side. I look like a pretty decent guy, don't I? I'm a terrorist. I've been declared a terrorist by the Department of Defense because I protest. That's what it's gotten to. I'm a grandfather. I got kids. 
I've done everything that I'm supposed to do, but I cannot protest without being declared a terrorist. And there's a lot of us out there. I think it's a little bit more sinister from the U.S. government and their drone warfare program. We have had 12 years of warfare to this point, endless wars that are being justified by terrorists. Oh my God, there's a terrorist over there. What we don't seem to know is that there are, have been, always been terrorists and they have always been dealt with with law enforcement and law and order. But that seems to have all been gone out the window. So I think it is this, this quest to keep the military industrial complex going by sinking more money into it, justifying the military, justifying the production of weapons. Out of every dollar we spend 66 cents on the military and on security and on police. God, folks, there's a different, there's, there's a much different, better way to do this, but I don't think Washington is interested in talking about it. Uh, you mentioned the possibilities that arise when other states acquire drones. Uh, is there any sort of conceivable risk that the groups we're currently using drones against uh, could begin to use drones themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's the same, um, the same sort of issue with um, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, right? There's always the, the um, fear that those weapons could fall into the hands of a terrorist organization or that um, a state might be willing to sell them to a terrorist organization. Um, and uh, we know, for example, that um, Pakistan's um, nuclear uh, arsenal it, it is not necessarily all that secure. So certainly there would be the possibility um, that you know, eventually the technology could get into, um, into other hands, although um, you know, the, it, it isn't anywhere near as dire as the possibility that they could, you know, weapons of mass destruction could fall into their hands. Um, and they'd have to be able to figure out how to use them as well. You know, this gets back to the whole idea that you actually have to have skilled people in high places in terrorist organizations in order for them to be able to effectively carry out um, attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Teresa? Where should you know, I'd like to be able to say, well, Congress could start this, but that, <laughs> that doesn't seem like a very good idea at the moment. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it needs to be um, kind of a public sphere debate. People need to, to talk about this with one another. Um, we need to have more of a discussion um, you know, in the media, for, for example. Um, people need to be willing to listen to critics of these programs rather than, than just simply accepting that you know, if it's an anti-terrorism mechanism, it must therefore be for my own security and I'm willing to just simply, um, simply accept that. Um, it would be helpful if um, Congress could hold he hearings uh, you know, if there is debate between the Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committees over who should have control of this program, then maybe they should have a hearing about that. Um, but until the executive branch decides that it's going to lift some of the secrecy around this, we aren't going to be able to have this conversation. Um, it is clear, though, the Obama administration has made changes in the last year in response to public pressure that is being placed on them um, by public opinion. Um, by human rights organizations, et cetera. Uh, and so it, there actually is the possibility that public, more public discussion of this actually could bring about changes to what the, to what the policy is. It seems that um, a number of aspects of this situation are, are things that we've seen before, um, that it's new technology, but um, we've been there with other forms of uh, military lethal technology. 
Um, it also seems that it's another manifestation about um, American exceptionalism and executive privilege. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, are there aspects of we've been there before that help us to chart a way forward, or are there so many aspects of this that are so new that it's um, uncharted territory? Well, you know, the laws and rules of, of war, international humanitarian law, is, is extremely well established. Um, and so there are ways to move forward. I mean, like, for example, if you read the, um, the UN Special Rapporteur's um, report, uh, it is, it's only about maybe 13 pages long. It's, it's really accessible. Um, he lays out um, the different components of the legal arguments. So, so who, who is it legitimate to target? Um, how can you decide if somebody is um, a civilian versus a combatant? So for example, um, if you are a civilian and not a member of a military, you could still be a, legit, a legitimate target if you are a direct participant in hostilities, right? Um, and posing an imminent threat. So there's a whole legal framework out there that we could be using to evaluate this program. Um, but the administration has put forward, um, you know, as I said earlier, this sort of very controversial, very aggressive interpretation of international um, humanitarian law. So I think that there, there, the rules are already out there that could help us decide uh, whether or not the targeted killing um, program should continue to move forward in its current form. Um, but there doesn't, both administrations have looked for ways to use the law to bolster the position they want to take rather than using the law to guide them to actually what is legal under those standards. Um, and so, you know, they have gone to great lengths to try to make an argument that they have the legal authority to do this. The problem is that, you know, sort of like the argument with torture, not very many other legal scholars are willing to accept those interpretations. I think we, j we need to go back to the already established laws and rules of war. Um, because by flouting them in the way that the United States is doing, you're, under, you're undermining them. And that, in the long run, hurts everyone. OK, so you mentioned that uh, the use of drones is obviously politically popular and that we do not have to commit troops on the ground. Um, I wondered if there are other groups that are lobbying for the use of this technology. Um, and another related question is, are there, in fact, some political leaders, congressmen, that have spoken out about the use of drones? Who are they, and why would they do that? Well, people like um, Ron Wyden, who's a representative from Oregon, has, in fact, um, spoken out about this. Um, you know, you, you do, you run the risk, though, um, as a politician, if you come out questioning U.S. drone policy, because, as you said, it is, it is popular, because it does mean that we don't have boots on the ground, and Americans aren't taking civilians, and we're being protected from terrorism, which seems to be the overriding national security concern of most um, most ordinary people. Um, I'm sorry, and I forgot the first part of your question, Laura. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people um, in the counterterrorism community think that the targeted killing is a useful tool. Um, you know, it has its supporters in the, um, in the military as well, but I would also say that, you know, among the very first people to start questioning the drone program and the use of, of armed drones were, in fact, military officers, like the JAG Corps, for example, who said, you know, there are some things about this that, are, that make us very uncomfortable. We need to kind of walk our way through this. Um, you have people in the CIA right now who are saying, look, the CIA needs to move away from this because we are um, undermining our chief function here. Um, so even within the organizations that are, are pushing or are using drones, you do have these voices that are saying, hey, wait a minute, we really need to, to think about this. Um, but again, those debates, it's hard to make them public um, when you have so little transparency around the program as a whole. Right? So um, 
the United States never confirms that the CIA has carried out a drone strike. Occasionally, it will confirm that JSOC carried out a drone strike. Um, but those organizations are not actually free to make public the kinds of debates that, that they're having. Some of the most interesting um, presentations that I've heard at professional conferences about the ethics of the use of drones have come from U.S. military officers. Do we have a last question? Yeah. So if we make the most extreme presumption of good faith, what's the argument for uh, keeping drone strikes under such a veil of secrecy? What's to be lost if uh, we know how many strikes are happening, if we know who is being killed by them? As with most things in counterterrorism, um, the argument that is that greater transparency will reveal to the terrorists the methods that the United States is using and will make it easier for them to come up with you know, um, efforts to counter those US measures, um, that it might reveal US intelligence sources, either the human intelligence sources or the methods the United States is using to gather the intelligence. Um, and, you know, as we know, sometimes when those things become public, i.e. spying on the cell phones of, you know, our allies' leaders, um, that can be, cause a lot of trouble. Um, and so the argument has always been a protection about the people and the methods the United States uses to gather intelligence and then not tipping off your hand to your to your adversary. No, actually, there have been um, Warren Palmer and Marion Fass have have um, done talks already in in this um, in this series, uh, and uh, Carolyn is really in, in in charge of doing this. I just think that the idea is to try to um, reach out to a broader community beyond just the students at the college to the local community, and then it's being streamed online as well. So alums or friends of the college, my mother, um, you know. <laughs> might be able to, um, to watch this. And my understanding is that um, later on this afternoon, it will actually be up on the website for people who are interested, you know, who couldn't tune in because their lunchtime didn't coincide with 10 after 12. Um, but I, I mean, I think that that's just the idea is to take a, a small amount of time to help share some of the expertise that the college has with a, a broader community, um, you know, including people who aren't even physically able to be here. Right, well, we actually are approaching the top of the hour, which probably means most people have to go back to work now that their lunch hour is over. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate um, all of the questions. Carolyn, is, do you know when the next one will be? Okay. Okay, yeah, so Twitter and Facebook for the next um, Lunchbox series. So thank you um, very much for your attention. I really appreciate it.